All right. All right. Thank you. Windows in update and change the order of defaults. I never approve updates. I always tell it no. Yeah, I probably approved it last time I was here. See, there you go. Yeah, I'm sure it's my fault. Got you Rawls I'm County sure guys. Sure. You live in Marion County. County. I know, but I can't be talking about You serve the community well, but you live in Marion County. Right. That's because I leave the problems to my folks that come to work. That's great. Got it? Some people like to be here, but that's right. everybody let me put this on should i walk her into Test, 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 test. There we go. I see Kansas City people. Barb and Kevin. Hi. Hi. All right. You all going to get weather tonight over there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what they're saying. Well, you can get it before us. A few hours before us. <laughs> all right. Everybody ready to rock and roll? Yep. <laughs> all right. Oh. Just while we're getting started, those of you online, I emailed these and put them on the Facebook page. You got them? Okay. We're going to be looking at these sheets tonight. In fact, I'll go ahead and hand these out real quick. Then we'll open with prayer and we'll get started. Good. Let me pull mine up too. I guess. Okay. This is the I think I can see. Make sure that we don't, uh, if we need to mute at any time. All right, let's open up with a word of prayer and we will get rocking and rolling. God, we do love you. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to gather here tonight. We thank you for this journey that we've been on since September through the story. We pray, God, that you will enable us to see our story through the, through the greater story which you have set in place and put into motion. We ask that, that your spirit be with all of us gathered tonight, whether we're online or in the classes upstairs or the teachers, the students, just everybody who's gathered tonight. God, may you be glorified. And uh, again, uh, there's, there's weather coming in, and we lift up to you those uh, who are going to be driving plows, the first responders, 
the healthcare providers, just be with all those, Lord, who'll be on the front lines caring for us in the coming days. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, so if you open up to chapter 19, which is page 263 of the story, we'll look at just a couple of items here, then we'll watch the video. And if, if I do not go to the video here in a couple of minutes, stop me and say, how come we're not watching the video? It means I forgot. Right? It means I forgot. Shailene, if you're watching, no comments. You know what she said? Welcome to my world. <laughs> All right. So uh, the, the top of page, uh, the beginning of chapter 19 that comes to us from Ezra, the book of Ezra, chapter one. And in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem and Judah. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem and Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. And in any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. So this is the year 538 BC. Remember in the year 722, so what 160, 70 years before this, the Northern kingdom of Israel had fallen, the Assyrians took them over, right? What did the Assyrians do with the, with the people of Israel living in the Northern tribes? Dispersed them. That's right. They dispersed them. They, they, they sent them into forced exile into all different corners of the Assyrian Empire. So then, uh, I think it was the year 608, 609, somewhere in there, the, the Assyrians were defeated by the Babylonians. The Babylonians eventually conquered the nation of Judah. And over the course of three rounds of deportations, they sent people not all over uh, their empire, but directly to Babylon. So if you look at this handout, and for right now, we'll just look, look at the front page. There's a timeline that affects our reading for this week to put everything into perspective. In 605, the first round of Judean exiles are taken to Babylon from Jerusalem. These young men were hostages to ensure Judean cooperation and paying tribute and remaining loyal to Babylon. And among those taken in this round were Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Obednego. And we talked about them over the course of the last two weeks. Jeremiah had been an active prophet of God since the year 626 BC. And he would remain active until after the fall of Jerusalem in 587. Okay, so Jeremiah is working during this time. Then in the year 597, there's a second round of Judean exiles taken to Babylon from Jerusalem. Among those taken in this second round was a young man named Ezekiel. He would become God's prophetic voice to his people living in exile. This round of forced deportation was taken due to King Jehoiakim's attempt at subverting Babylonian political authority over Judea, right? So Nebuchadnezzar was like, tried to leave you guys alone. I took your hostages. I took your tribute. All you had to do was be good. Now I'm going to take some of your best and brightest and, and move them to Babylon. In the year 592, Ezekiel, who's living in Babylon, is called by God into prophetic ministry upon his 30th birthday. And why is 30, his 30th birthday uh, important for Ezekiel? Do you remember? 
the reason for that? That's when, if he went back to Jerusalem, he would have started in Turkey. Oh, that's right. Ezekiel is from uh, the priestly family. So when he turned 30, he would begin working in the temple in Jerusalem. So, Joe, you're absolutely right. That when he turned 30 in exile, God put him to work, but in a, in a different manner. Okay. Uh, he is given visions, and he acts out living parables of the coming fall and destruction of Jerusalem. Remember, we talked about some of those living parables that he did. You know, he, he, he built a miniature diorama of Jerusalem, and then he attacked it. Then he laid on his side for a year as he was bound, and he only ate food that was cooked over animal dung. Um, just all kinds of bizarre things. And, you know, did the people receive well what, Jer what Ezekiel was telling them? No. No. I mean, they thought he was a nut job. Okay? And they did pay attention. But then in the year 587, on your sheet there, the third round of Judean exiles taken to Babylon are taken to Babylon from Jerusalem. This was the largest group of people taken to Babylon and followed the destruction of Jerusalem and the Holy Temple of God, built by Solomon 400 years earlier. This time of suffering and grief was caused by King Jehoiakim. He's also called Zedekiah. His attempt at undermining Babylonian sovereignty over Judea. Remember, he stopped paying tribute and he tried to make an alliance with Egypt. And... Uh, Nebuchadnezzar wasn't going to have it, and, and the brutality that he exhibited under the people in Jerusalem was something that we can't begin to, to fathom. Okay. Now, I don't have this written down, but between 587 and 539, we have the stories that we read this past week in Daniel. Right? Remember, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, and Daniel in the lion's den. Um, that's all happening in this in-between time. Then, in the year 539, the Persian Empire defeats the Babylonian Empire. So if you look at a modern political map, the Babylonians are approximately the nation of Iraq today. And the Persians would be what nation? Iran. 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 So in the year 539, King Cyrus of Persia enters the capital city of Babylon. In the year 538, he's still in his first year of reign, and this is what we just read about, King Cyrus of Persia issues an edict that the different people groups held in exile in Babylon are free to return to their homelands, rebuild their economies, and reconstruct their temples. And, and, he, and he did multiple decrees because it wasn't just the Jewish people who were allowed to return to their homeland. But the Babylonians had taken lots of different people groups and brought them to Babylon over the previous hundred years or so. The Persian, the Persian king, now, his practice isn't to hold people in bondage at all. He wants them to go home. He wants them to be happy. He wants them to be successful. He wants them to pay taxes. Right? If, you, if you want happy people in your country, how do you treat them? You treat them well, right? So that's the Persian model. So that picture on the bottom, that is called the Cyrus Cylinder, and it is held uh, in the British Museum in London, and it is one of the finest museums in the world. Have any of you been to the British Museum in London? Okay, there's nobody here for me to be what jealous of. That? <laughs> All right. The Cyrus Cylinder... Uh, on that cylinder, that is a Babylonian script. Or I'm sorry, it is Persian script. And it is uh, one of the edicts that Cyrus gave that freed a particular people group to go home in the year 538 BC. Right? And we know this happened. There's all kinds of historical evidence that, that, that points to this. So then our reading from this week, right? If you read chapter 19, it tells the story of that first round of uh, Jewish folks who returned from exile from Babylon to Jerusalem. Right? And eventually what they returned to probably resembled the surface of the moon. Right? Jerusalem had been leveled. 
leveled. Nobody was living there except for, you know, a few people trying to scrape out an existence in the, in just out of nothing. And uh, these were very, very brave men and women and children who made that return journey and tried to make something happen of it, trusting in God. So let's go ahead and watch the video for this week. And uh, we'll dig into chapter 19. My story. But most of all, this is the greatest story ever told. This is God's story. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. And may their God be with them. And in any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold with goods and livestock and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Then the family's heads of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and Levites, everyone whose heart God has moved, prepare to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. All their neighbors assisted them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with valuable gifts, in addition to all the free will offerings. Moreover, King Cyrus brought out the articles belonging to the temple of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and had placed in the temple of his God. Sometimes life is all about pig slop. The prodigal son can tell you about the pig slop. He smelt it, felt it, served it. He may have even tasted it. In one of Jesus' best-known stories, Jesus described the pigpen experience of a stubborn-hearted son. The boy, born in privilege, demanded his inheritance before his father's death. He took the money to a first-century equivalent of Monte Carlo. Within a few days, he was on a first-name basis with the casino manager. Within a few more, he was dead broke, looking for a job. He found one feeding pigs. The salary must have stunk as much as the swine did because the boy was soon drooling over pig slop. He seriously considered taking a place at the trough and digging in. That's when he came to his senses and got back on track with his life. But it took some pig slop to get his attention. The prodigal son and pigs, the Jews and the abandoned temple foundation. What do these stories have in common? They both focus on the answer to this question. What happens when God's big thing becomes our small thing? Stated otherwise, what does God do when we get off track? Well, here's the backstory. The children of Israel have passed the last 70 winters in Babylonian exile. Their city was razed and the beloved temple was ransacked. 
Except for the courage of Daniel and his three friends, the error would have been a shameful one. But after seven decades of clouds, a tunnel of sunlight pierces the clouds and surprises the people. Listen to how the story of chapter 19 opens. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, the king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put it in writing. This is what King Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you, may their God be with them and let them go up to Jerusalem and Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. And in any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. God, pulling the strings from the upper story, turned the heart of King Cyrus toward the Jews and turned the Jews toward Jerusalem. He prompted the king to give the exiles permission and resources to rebuild the temple. Why? Why would God prompt such an endeavor? He knows he needs no house. God does not dwell in temples made with hands. God does not need a place to live. But he does desire a picture to use. And the temple of ancient Israel served as a picture and proof of God's big thing. His desire to dwell in the midst of his people. Think about it. Where was the temple located? In the midst of the people, smack dab in the center of the most populated pocket of Jews. Where does God want to dwell? You got it. Not in a distant mountain or isolated island. God moves into the neighborhood and sets up shop. The temple spoke volumes toward God's passion for proximity. The temple also illustrated our problem with iniquity. Could anyone enter the Holy of Holies? No, only the reverend, and then only after a blood sacrifice. Access to the Holy of Holies came only after blood had been shed for the sins of the people. Each time a priest sacrificed the lamb, the Jews were reminded of this truth. The temple was a divine teaching aid, a daily reminder of God's passion for proximity, our problem with iniquity, God's solution, access, through the shedding of blood. And now after seven decades without a teaching tool, it was time to rebuild it. Initially, God's big thing was their big thing. Dissenters and outsiders tried first to infiltrate and then later to discourage the temple builders. But the Jews maintained their resolve. They stayed focused on God's big thing. They made God's priority their priority. But after a few years, they began to grow weary. Perhaps the stone stacking was too tiresome or the criticism too irksome, or maybe they began thinking of their own projects, their farms, houses, and businesses. And one by one, little by little, person by person, they turned away from God's big thing and quit working on the temple. In the lower story, God's big thing became their small thing. They concentrated on their own homes and businesses. We'll get back to the house of God, they surely reasoned, next week, next month, after the harvest, after the turn of the year. And before they knew it, 16 years came and went. 16 years, enough time for grass to grow and cover the footers of the foundation, enough time for neighboring nations to conclude that Israel's God wasn't worth any devotion. Enough time for a generation of Jewish children to look at the abandoned temple like a forgotten <laughs> construction project. Meanwhile, as the house of God languished, the houses of the Jews flourished. Fine paneled houses. The former exiles built businesses and enterprises and to their surprise grew more and more miserable by the day. Take a highlighter to the words of Haggai. Is it time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? 
Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountain and bring down timber and build the house so that I might take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You know how God responds to the lethargy and misplaced priorities? You just read it. Ever wonder what God does when we make his big thing a small thing and our small thing big things? Well, now you know. Now, let's be careful here. We don't need to attribute every single setback or struggle to God's discipline. No need to get philosophical over each red light or headache. There are, however, seasons of God-ordained struggles, times of exhaustive emptiness. These days exist for one purpose, to turn our hearts back to God's house. When nothing quenches our deepest thirst, when no achievements abate our restless hunger, when drought turns our fields into deserts and retirements into pocket change, what can we do? God's answer is clear. Give careful thought to your ways. Evaluate your priorities. Assess your strategies. Is God's big thing my big thing? Now, for many of you, the answer is a resounding yes. Others of you would have to give a different answer. And still others of you reading the story of the forgotten temple and thinking, that is my story. You too were released from Babylon. Like the Jews, you were set free, not of foreign captivity, but of chemical dependency, of selfish ambition, of empty days and lonely nights, the hollow pursuit of stuff. You put Babylon in your rearview mirror and came home. You gave your heart to God and your life to God's work. But then came the kids, the promotion, the transfer, the long hours, the business trips. With each passing day, you thought less and less about God's work and more about your work. <laughs> Tithing became tipping. Prayers became rote quotes. You didn't forget God, but you didn't remember him either. And it could very well be that you can relate to the people of Haggai's day. Life just doesn't work like you hoped. And now God has pulled you aside for him face to face. It's time to consider your ways. It's time to wash off the pig mud and get after it. Go up into the mountains and bring down the timber and build the house. Amazingly, the Jews did. The Lord stirred up the leadership and the people got to work on the house of God and they finished it. And God was once again living and dwelling among the people. C.S. Lewis said, put first things first and we get second things thrown in. Put second things first and we lose both first and second things. The prodigal son learned this. He put his father first and was given a seat at the table. As God's plan continues to unfold to bring his ultimate solution through Israel, let us heed the challenge in our own lives to make God's big things our big thing. Jim, we're proud that you didn't go to sleep. <laughs> So page 263, let's just work through the chapter and uh, we'll refer back to the worksheet without the worksheet, the handout. So beginning at the, be at the top of a chapter 19 through uh, the top of page 266 were the italics is. That is Ezra chapter one, excerpts of chap Ezra chapter one through Ezra chapter four. 
And then it goes into some readings from uh, the book of Haggai. And then there's readings from chapter one and two, or chapter one and eight of Zechariah. And then, he, then the story goes back to Ezra uh, for chapters five and six. So remember, the story is written chronologically, not canonically. So sometimes it bounces around as it, as it takes you through. But it wants to give you an ordered reading of the events that were taking place. Uh, so if, if we're reading from the book of Ezra, it helps me, you know, you may wonder, who is Ezra? Who was that guy? And Ezra was a scribe from the court of Darius, who was the son of Cyrus. And he lived uh, after the temple. Well, he came to Jerusalem what, 20, 40, 40 some years after the temple had been rebuilt. And he, he led a second round of exiles home. But he was a scribe, he was attributed to writing the books of First and Second Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah. You know, familiar with Ezra and Nehemiah? Uh, Nehemiah came to Jerusalem a few years after Ezra did, and we'll read about him in two weeks. But Ezra or Nehemiah led the third round of exiles back to Jerusalem. Um, Ezra, it's worth noting. Uh, there's a very famous battle. This would be for the history nerds out there, for people who like movies, maybe. But in the year 480 BC, a very famous battle took place on the Greek, uh, the Greek mainland, uh, above Achaia, where all the little tiny islands are. It's a very famous battle where 300 Spartans, led by Leonidas, held off supposedly a million. Persians being led by Xerxes. Does this sound familiar to you? What was the name of, what was this battle called? Thermopylae. Yeah, very good. I thought somebody was going to say 300, like the movie. Right? Yeah, it was the Battle of Thermopylae. So that, that is the same time frame that we're looking at right here, though. <laughs> it's just to put things into a larger perspective. But Xerxes is the, fun, is the son of Darius. But he's not around yet. We're working on his dad, Darius, for our chapter today. So just as we step in here on, on page 264, that first full paragraph reads, Moreover, King Cyrus brought out the articles belonging to the temple of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and had placed in the temple of his God. So, you know, as you're reading through the book of Exodus and Leviticus, we begin to get an idea of this massive number of very expensive, not massive, a significant number of very expensive gold, silver, and bronze um, furnishings that were used in, in the tabernacle and then in the temple. And, of course, when Jerusalem fell, or when the temple was destroyed, that, that, they're worth a lot of money. You know, you would measure the gold and silver and bronze out. You know, you would trade it by the pound or value it by the pound. That was all taken to Babylon and put in storage. Or actually, it's put into the treasury of, of the nation. But again, Cyrus is a, is a benevolent ruler rather than a malevolent ruler, right? It means he wants good things for his people. And, he, and if he wants them to rebuild their temple back in Judea or in Judah and Jerusalem, they need the furnishings from the temple so that they can properly worship their God. So he, he, he releases everything that's been held. Um, over 5,400 pieces of gold and silver. Uh, that's in the next paragraph down. And then we read, the whole company numbered 42,360 besides their 7,337 male and female slaves. Well, if they were able to have servants or slaves while they were being held in exile in Babylon, what, what does that tell about how they were living in Babylon? Not too bad. Yeah, not too bad. They were prospering. The Jewish people prospered in Babylon. And in fact, a, a significant number of them didn't want to go back to Jerusalem 
That wasn't their home. That's not where they were born. That's not where they were raised. They're from Babylon. They, their families have thrived there. And up until the 20th century, the late 20th century, there was a significant Jewish population in Iraq and Christian population in Iraq. And the, the population of both those communities now is almost zero over the course of the last 20 to 30 years. Okay, so that means that 49,697 people, uh, along with their 200 male and female singers, which makes it 49,897 people. And they packed up their belongings on 736 horses, 245 mules, 435 camels, and 6,720 donkeys. Right. Uh, this is not some small operation of people returning back home. This is basically a major military logistical move. And it would have taken many, many weeks, months to get the people from Babylon back to Jerusalem. Because they didn't just go in a straight line from Babylon, you know, modern day Baghdad, say, over to uh, What we got going on? Is this a super secret project? Yes. All right. So how come they couldn't just go directly from, from Iraq to Israel? There's mountains. There's mountains, but there's something else that's, that's vast. Desert. Desert. No water. Right. They couldn't do that. So instead, they had to take the, the Euphrates River up into modern day southeastern Turkey, you know, Azerbaijan area, uh, uh, Syria, and then make a big arc and come down. They could only go where they could get water for their animals and for themselves. And it was a lengthy and dangerous, hard trip. But they made it, right? They, they, they made this journey. And in the italics there on 264, the Babylonians appointed Zerubbabel, grandson of Jehoiachin, Judah's next to last king, as governor of Judah, making him the last of the line of David to be entrusted with political authority. Around the year 537, Zerubbabel led these nearly 50,000 people back home to begin their rebuilding mission with long, hard labor ahead of them. The people remembered to put first things first. With courage and conviction, they rebuilt the altar first and then laid the foundation for the house of God. True worship was again a reality. Now, uh, again, Jehoiachin, um, if you look on your chart the chart of kings right he's also known as zedekiah and he was a bad bad cat but his grandson is not he's a good guy he's a good guy and he's going to faithfully try to get these people to get back home and to go about the, the cleaning process or the, the, re, the rebuilding process. Down below that italics, and this is reading from Ezra chapter three. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, the people assembled together as one in Jerusalem. Then Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, and his fellow priest, and Zerubbabel, son of Shiltiel, and his associates began to build the altar of the God of Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it in accordance with what is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And that next sentence is, 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 is important. Despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, 
both the morning and evening sacrifices. Okay, so they, they, they make it back to Judah, to the, to the environs around Jerusalem. They had to find a place to, to live because there's no place to live in Jerusalem. There is no Jerusalem anymore. But what, so what's the first act they do once they secure housing? They come together, right? And Dustin, that's absolutely right. They, they build an altar. Okay? And so this would have been on the same footing as the, the original temple that Solomon had built. Right? They had to clear all the rubble off. And they built an all, altar. And why are altars so important to Jewish people in the ancient world? Sacrifice. Sacrifices. Sacrifice. Why are sacrifices important? It's an offering to the Lord. What kind of offering? Blood, blood. 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 blood offerings. Sin, Sin offerings, Sin. right? Yeah, they're offerings for atonement, right? So that they're worthy to come into the presence of God, right? Uh, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> okay, uh, then we get, then we turn to. Page 265, that paragraph that begins, and all the people, do you see that? But all of the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. So after they built the altar, they'd done sacrifices, they went about uh, re-securing the foundation on which the temple is going to be built. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple, wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. So those who wept would have been quite elderly in order to, to have memories of the original temple. Why would they, why, why were they weeping, do you think? It's not joy. Yeah, that's, that's right. The, 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 the temple that they are going to build is, is a fraction of the size of the original temple that Solomon had built. It didn't have the grandiosity. It didn't have all the gold and silver. It was a bare bones, stone, and wood structure. And those who remembered the beauty of the temple that Solomon had built, they were devastated that, that this is what they were going to have to offer to God, right? And there was something else missing from this temple that was in Solomon's temple. It disappeared when Jerusalem fell, and it's never been found since. The Ark of the Covenant, right? The Ark of the Covenant. Now, of course, there's people who claim they know where it is. You know, there's these Ethiopian Coptic priests who live in a, in a, what do you call it? It's not a monk house. It's a, what do you call those places? A what? It gets a square building. Right. Yeah, but where, where do monks live? Monastery. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Monk house. But, yeah. 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 You know, we have maybe you've seen it on the History Channel or on the Smithsonian Channel. You know, they have these specials where it's it's just a simple brick or a stone square house. There's a like a gate around it. Nothing elaborate. And these monks, they go in there, and they, they say the Ark of the Covenant is there. It was taken there because the Queen of Sheba was from there, and that's how they hid it from the Babylonians. And that, uh, and that to this day, as these monks guard it and keep vigil over it, it blinds them. Right? They lose their, their sight, and they say it's because the presence of God is on, is on the Ark. Mysteriously enough, no one's been allowed to see it. Right? Well, they've got something going on in there. We just don't know what. But why is the Ark of the Covenant so important for Jewish people? It's the holy. It's the what? The holy seat. It's the presence of God. It's yeah. Right. So it's inside the Ark. It's it's, it's a box, right? It's, it's a box made of acacia wood. It's it's got gold plating around it. But what's inside the Ark? There's manna. Uh, the, the, the law of God is in it, right? That, that, that Moses carried down the mountain. And I think Aaron's staff was in there, or a portion of it. 
And, but the, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that the lid of the ark had two cherubim on it with their wings extended inward like this, right? And that created something that's, you know, remember what, that, what that's called, that lid? The mercy seat, that's right. And why is the mercy seat so important? God. Yeah, it's, it's where the glory, the presence of God physically manifests itself and dwells. So on the annual day of atonement, you remember what, what, what day that's called? Typically it happens in the autumn. Yom Kippur, right? Uh, Kippur means atonement. So on the annual day of atonement, the high priest would go in and sprinkle blood on the mercy seat seven times to atone for the sins of the people of Israel. Well, they're weeping. The ark's gone. The temple that was there will never be what it was. So how can they fully atone for their sins without the mercy seat of God's presence? This, is, this, this must have been a traumatizing. Uh, for folks, just try to put yourself in their situation. But yet, it says that other people were weeping or were uh, were crying with joy. Why do you think they were joyful? They were home. I mean, yeah, their culture was becoming their own again. Yeah, they could rebuild even a smaller world. Yeah, that's right. Things are being made new. Okay. They're home. They have a chance to start fresh. And maybe it's not what grandma and grandpa told them it was like, but there's something beautiful about being able to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to offer sacrifices. They didn't have the mercy seat to, to sprinkle blood on, but they sprinkled blood onto the altar uh, that they built. And, uh, and, they, and, and so it was this rare time when there's weeping and there's joy and it's all mixed together in this beautiful, right, conglomeration all at once. Then the next paragraph down, when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, let us help you build because like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Esther Haddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. So who are these people? Who are they going to become? The these are the Samaritans, right? Just like the Assyrians uprooted the people of Israel and dispersed them to other parts of the realm, so they dispersed, uprooted other peoples and brought them into Israel. And those peoples are syncretists. Y'all know what that word refers to, syncretism? It's where you, you combine the worship of multiple gods into one. Right? I've told the story before about the Christian Buddhist. Remember that story? Right? People do all kinds of crazy things with religion. They'll take, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll take, yeah, that's right. It's like a buffet, right? You pick and choose what you like from from uh, all these different religions of the world. Maybe you like some wisdom that comes with Hinduism or Buddhism, and you want to mix that uh, with some Jewish, uh, Kabbalah, not Kabbalah, is that it? Kabbalah. Yeah, Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism. Yeah, a lot of people are interested in that. Then you take you know, just Eastern mysticism with, with Japanese Shintoism, and you're going to combine that with the idea of Jesus being a wonderful rabbi teacher, and you get this whole mixture of stuff. You see, that, 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 that's mud. And God says, that's an abomination before me. So they don't want, the Jewish people don't want these Samaritan people to help them. They don't want the wrong kind of thoughts invading and practices invading the building of the temple in that next paragraph but Zerubbabel Joshua and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered you have no part with us in building a temple to our God we alone will build it for the Lord the God of Israel as King Cyrus the king of Persia commanded us huh? that was their way out right you really can't help us because Cyrus said so 
right? They got an out. So then it says that, that the peoples around them set to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They bribed officials to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, down to the reign of his son, Darius, who was the king of Persia. Thus, the work on the house of God in Jerusalem came to a standstill until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So on that handout for tonight, if you look on the back page, let's, let's look at that. Uh, the year 538, 537, approximately 50,000 Jewish exiles led by Zerubbabel and Shashbazar. These are great names, right? Remember those Scantron tests? You ever have those in school? You had to, you know, fill out your name. Could you imagine if your name was Zerubbabel or Shashbazar? You know, fill out those that was Mark. I loved it. Boom, boom, boom. All right. Fun. Oh, playing at the game? No. Yeah. You never win if that was your name. No. All, right. <laughs> All right. So uh, the exiles made that long journey back to Jerusalem. It had been 67 years since the first round of exiles left Jerusalem for Babylon. It had been 51 years since Jerusalem, including the temple, had been destroyed. Just to put it in perspective, um, I'm 49 and a half years old. So it... Uh, during my lifetime, the temple had not existed for these people. Okay. Upon arriving in Jerusalem, which may have resembled the surface of the moon, the newly returned exiles begin the work of rebuilding the temple on the same location as the original. The first, they first rebuilt the altar so sacrifices could resume. Then they began to lay the foundation for the new building. It was a shadow of the glory of the original temple built by Solomon. Okay. Then in 536 to 534, for a variety of reasons, work on the temple ground to a halt. And that's where we're at in the story on top of page 266. And it would remain unfinished, essentially dormant, for the next 14 to 16 years. So from what we can gather from reading Haggai and, and, and Zechariah, they got the foundation laid, and they had begun to, to build some of the walls up, then it stopped, right? And Randy, you know, on the video talked about, well, you know, they got busy, they became focused on themselves, you know, all the, it, it, I'm sure that's absolutely true, right? Life, life goes quick, you blink your eyes and 10 years go by. I think most of us can appreciate that, right? Time goes by fast. But just imagine, you know, think of, of a blighted area that one time was lovely. You know, just kind of have that in, in your mind. And that's what children growing up, that's the image they have, right? This is the temple that's before them. This is what their parents had promised they were going to rebuild and their grandparents and aunts and uncles. And there it was, weed infested, rat infested, who knows what else infested? Just an abomination to the community. It just sat there dormant. And it wasn't just because they were lazy. It was also because there were government officials living in that area, and, and, and we'll get to them in just a minute, who were actively working against the Jewish people reestablishing themselves. Why do you think people would be against the Jewish people coming home? Any ideas? Power. Yeah. Well, power. Yeah. New people had come in, right? You know, those fields that your ancestors took care of, those vineyards that they tended, they're not yours anymore. My family took that. This is where we make our living. You just can't come back here after 50 or 60, 70 years and suddenly say it's yours. <laughs> I don't According to the words of my favorite TV show of all time, I don't think so, Tim. You guys know what show that is? Home Improvement? Yeah. More power. Right? In the year 520, God raised up two new prophets to admonish and to encourage his people to complete the temple. 
These prophets were Haggai and Zechariah. Haggai, uh, just we don't know a lot about him. Uh, he appeared on the scene in, uh, we actually know the dates, uh, right there on page 266, halfway down under the italics. That is Haggai chapter 1. Haggai is the second shortest book in the Old Testament. Only Obadiah is shorter. You can sit down, folks, and we have a bad habit of letting chapter numbers and verse numbers get in the way. But you could read Haggai in about 10 minutes, just straight through, just read it. And uh, we know that chapter one was written on August 29th in the year 520 BC because he dates it for us. Now you have to, those are lunar dates. You have to put the Gregorian calendar into that. And then chapter two was written on October 17th in the year 520 BC. That's when Haggai's on the scene. We don't hear from him ever again. But Zechariah appears in the year 520 BC. He's from a priestly family. In fact, we know quite a bit about him. He would become the head of his priestly clan, and he would actively work as a prophet of God from the year 520 to the year 480. So for 40 years, he was actively working as a prophet in Jerusalem, as the culture, as the economy, as practices were reestablished, and the nation began to thrive again. Zechariah is also famous because in the first eight chapters, it's about this time period of rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem. But Chapters 9 through, are there 14 chapters in Zechariah, something like that? Those last chapters are messianic, prophetic voices, right? Uh, they're, 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 they're visions of the coming Messiah. And if you have a Bible, if you look in Zechariah chapter 9, there's a real famous one here. If you look at Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, 9 through 10. Zechariah 9, 9 to 10. Anybody got that and want to read it loudly? Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the pole of a donkey. I will take away the chariot from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem. And the battle vow will be broken. <clears throat> he will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Ah, that's the, the most famous prophecy that comes from Zechariah. And, and what does what what did, what day does that remind us of? Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. Behold, the king comes humble and riding on a donkey. Right. Jesus fulfills that, that prophecy. Okay, so Haggai on pages 266 to 267, in chapter one, he admonishes the people, you know, uh, on the bottom of 266. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so I may take pleasure in it and be honored. Now, you expected much, but see, it turned out to be a little what you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord? He's going to tell them why. Why are you struggling? Why are you suffering? Why are you unhappy? Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. All right, then he says you know, that a drought's going to come upon them until they build it. And then chapter 2 of Haggai, which begins in the bottom of page 267, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on that because that's the text for Sunday morning. But that is words of hope and assurance and promise right? <laughs> that God has not forgotten them. God has not forsaken them. That God indeed has a plan for them. Okay, uh, bottom of 268 to 269, we're in Zechariah country. And on the page of two, top of 269, Top of 269, that's reading from Zechariah chapter 8. Beautiful stuff. This is what the Lord Almighty says. And I encourage you, when you're reading scripture and God is speaking and you have shalls and wills, stress them. 
as you say it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will save my people from the countries of the east and west. I will bring them back to live in Jerusalem. They will be my people, and I will be faithful and righteous to them as their gods, as their God, excuse me. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Now hear these words. Let your hands be strong so that the temple may be built. God wants that temple built, right? So they're going to get it built. So on page 270, we go back to Ezra. Ezra chapter 5, and we read there halfway down the page. At that time, you see that paragraph? You have at that time, Tatani, governor of Trans-Euphrates, and Shethar Bozani, and their associates went to them and asked, who authorized you to build this temple and to finish it? These are powerful people within the bureaucratic structure of the Persian Empire, and they don't want the temple to be rebuilt. So the next paragraph, uh, they're going to write a letter to Darius, right? So Cyrus has died. Darius's son is now the king, the emperor of Persia. And this is a copy of the letter that Titane, governor of Trans-Euphrates, and Shethar Bozani and their associates, the officials of Trans-Euphrates, sent to Darius. The report they sent him read as follows. To King Darius, cordial greetings. See, even in the ancient world, they knew how to write letters. They didn't have email, which ruined people's letter writing ability. <laughs> the king should know that we went to the district of Judah to the temple of the great God. The people are building it with large stones and placing the timbers in the walls. The work is being carried on with diligence and is making rapid progress under their direction. We questioned the elders and asked them, who authorized you to rebuild this temple and to finish it? We also asked them their names so that we could write down the names of their leaders for your information. And this is the answer they gave us. You know, they, they just tell the truth. Cyrus decreed this and he gave us money and he sent us on our way. So now then towards the bottom of 271. Now, if it pleases the king, let a search be made in the royal archives of Babylon to see if King Cyrus did in fact issue a decree to rebuild this house of God in Jerusalem. Then let the king send us his decision in this matter. Well, they're hoping for a bureaucratic snafu. They're hoping the papers didn't get filed. They're hoping they're not in the right place. Okay? And they, 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 it's not like they could type you know, into their word processor under search keywords, right? This was probably an enormous task. So then on the next paragraph, King Darius then issued an order and they searched in the archives stored in the treasury at Babylon and a scroll was found in the citadel of Ekbatana in the province of Media and this was written on it. Memorandum. See, they had memos in the ancient world. In the first year of King Cyrus, the king issued a decree concerning the temple of God in Jerusalem. Blah, blah, blah. Right? It affirms everything the Jewish people had told Tetani and then those other knuckleheads. Then, then this is this is this is great stuff. You, you see where it says, now then Tetani, governor of Trans Euphrates, and Shethar Bozani, and you other officials of that province, stay away from there. Do not interfere with the work on this temple of God. Let the governor of the Jews and the Jewish elders rebuild this house of God on this site. Moreover, I hereby decree that you are to do for these elders of the Jews and the construction of this house of God. Their expenses are to be fully paid out of the royal treasury from the revenues of Trans-Euphrates so that the work will not stop. So who's paying for it? <laughs> the guys who are complaining are getting stuck with the bill, right? They're going to have to pay for it. I like how the King Darius handled this situation. Whatever is needed, young bulls, rams, male lambs for burnt offerings to the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, and olive oil, as requested by the priest in Jerusalem, they must be given to them daily without fail, so they may offer sacrifices pleasing to the God of heaven, 
and pray for the well-being of the king and his sons. And it gets better. Furthermore, I decree that if anyone defies this edict, a beam is to be pulled from their house and they are to be impaled on it. And for this crime, their house is to be made a pile of rubble. What else? Now, I was, I was sitting with the Gibbons here during dinner, and we looked in, in Anaz elementary school chapter for the story. That is not in there, <laughs> right? About impaling people from their house being, right? But I mean, these people mean business. You are to leave them alone. They are to rebuild their temple and their city and their community and their economy. And if you don't leave them alone, it, the, the repercussions will be severe. Okay, bottom of the middle of page 273 in italics. So on March 12th in the year 516, so it's four years since Haggai and Zephaniah arrived on the scene, almost 70 years after its destruction, the rebuilding of the temple was complete. Sustained work had continued on the project for three and a half years. Though not as large or spectacular as Solomon's temple, the rebuilt temple actually enjoyed a longer life. And if you look on that handout, this is kind of the last thing we'll, we'll look at. There's some illustrations. Don't try to read that little font unless you have a magnifying glass. That, that little font's not the reason I, I included these. The temple, the, the picture on the left, that's Zerubbabel's temple, okay? That's what he built. It's a, it's a very simple stone structure, okay? Then on the right, you see there, there, there's two temples. Do you see that? There's a little tiny dot on the left, and these are to scale. That little one on the left is Solomon's temple that he built in the ninth century BC. Now that little Solomon's temple is bigger and grander than Zerubbabel's temple. Are you tracking with me? Okay. Zerubbabel's temple stood for 500 years as the temple to the one true living God until a certain man named Herod, known as Herod the Great, became the, the, the Roman puppet king of Judah. His capital was in Jerusalem. He was a great builder, and he had a desire to, to upgrade the temple of the one true living God. So his temple is on the right, and it took 70 years to, to rebuild from the little Zerubbabel temple to the grand Herod temple. And the Herod Temple Complex is, is the New Testament temple. Jesus went there. He was blessed there when he was seven, uh, when he was a little boy. Remember, his parents took him to see Anna and uh, who was the old guy, Simeon, right, in the temple. Uh, when, he was, when he was just, a, was he nine, nine or 12 at Passover, he, he, he didn't go home like he was supposed to with the family, and he hung out there for three days, and his parents got mad at him I would have been mad too and you know it was in that temple we read about about the apostles teaching and preaching and doing miracles in the temple in the book of Acts it was in Herod's temple and that temple stood until the year 70 AD what happened in the year 70 yeah right in the, I think it was the year 67, the great Jewish revolt against Rome took place. And Rome uh, sent legions into Judah, led by Vespasian and Titus, father-son team, left and right. And the, 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 the Jewish people held off for a while, but eventually they were defeated. Um, have you heard of Megiddo? Were a couple of hundred Jewish fighters and their families committed suicide rather than be taken prisoner and slaves by the Romans. Anyway, the Romans, Romans completely sacked the temple complex. They didn't sack Rome or Jerusalem, but they destroyed the temple. They ground it into dust. Then in the year 125 AD, the Bar Kokhba revolt took place. Simon Bar Kokhba 
the son of the son of the star, son of the light. And he was believed to be the Messiah by many of the Jewish people. He led another revolt against Rome. And this time the, the legions came in, tore the walls of Jerusalem down, ground them into powder, salted the fields. You know why they would salt fields? That's right. Couldn't produce any crop, right? They dammed up wells, tried to dry up any streams they could get. They just utter devastation upon the land. And uh, these are the hardships that those people that those people endured for hundreds and hundreds of years. But to get back to this, we're winding down for the day. Zerubbabel's temple stood for 500 years. God did grant peace to the land for about what 230 years. But then a young Greek general, he's Macedonian actually, led his hoplites into Judah. And do you know what his name is? He's a very famous person. Alexander. Alexander the Great. He took Jerusalem and he died. The Ptolemies took it. And then in the 100s, the Maccabees, the Jewish family overthrew the Ptolemies and there was Jewish rule for about a hundred years. And then uh, they couldn't decide between themselves who should rule them. So they invited a Roman general named Pompey, you ever heard that name before, to come in and just arbitrate between them who should be the ruler of Judah and Jerusalem. Let's just say he welcomed the opportunity to bring his legions into the country, and they never left. Okay, not for hundreds of years, anyway. So if you love history, this is a great time to be reading the Bible, through the Bible, while this is going on. Okay, questions? Oh, yeah. And then just a general question, but I've been talking a lot. I'm curious what you all are thinking. The, the story of return from exile, the rebuilding of the temple, the beginning of the rebuilding of Jerusalem, how does that point us to Christ? Right? I mean, the, the entire Old Testament points to a telos, right? To an end point, which is Jesus. He's not going to be born for 500 and some years, but how does the return from exile point us? To Jesus. At some point, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Everything will be rebuilt. That's absolutely right. That, that that's a big portion of it, anyway. You remember that the last chapters in Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah, they all point to a new reality, a, a new home. A, it in part refers to this rebuilding of Jerusalem, but it also points to something yet to come. Anything else regarding Jesus, though? If us and our soul, we are separated from God and our sin, just like the Jewish people were separated from the presence of God in their mind, like without one of the marks there, without the Holy Spirit. They were separated from the presence of God. And due to our sinful nature, we bore Christ in our being, for the invention of the Holy Spirit and whatnot, we are separated from God. Okay. What? Well, let's just hold off till Lent. We're going to get to the New Testament here in a couple of weeks. Next week, we're going to read about a Jewish lady who becomes a princess, lives in Persepolis in the capital uh, during, the, during this time. And her name is Esther. Esther. Very good. Then the week after that is Ash Wednesday. So we're not going to meet, but if you're going to keep up with your reading, and I hope you do, you're going to read about Nehemiah and rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem and the prophecies of Malachi. That's the last book in the Old Testament. Because once Lent starts, we are in the New Testament. And everything we've read so far, I know some of it's probably felt pretty tedious to you, but everything we've read so far sets the stage for Jesus being born and the work of redemption which he offers on our behalf on the cross. It's coming. It's going to all start making more sense when Jesus gets on the scene.
although sometimes it gets even harder to understand. Okay. Questions, comments? Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion. Is there a second? That's usually the fastest one. And we didn't even get you all need to come to a session meeting. When you ask, is there a second to adjourn? It's immediately. Who wants to send us home? I keep I, I, I keep waiting for Horshack to show up from Welcome Back, Cotter. Some of you may not know who that is. I saw it the other day on TV. It looked like an ancient TV show. Ancient TV. That's a great show. Ooh, Mr. I, Cotter, choose me, choose me. Father, dismiss us with your blessing tonight. We thank you for your word for Mark and his teaching, just for the knowledge that we are receiving from the study of your word to the story. Send us home safe and sound, ready to prepare for whatever is to face us from the weather standpoint. Keep us safe and, and help us to understand and glorify you in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. My watch says it's raining outside. I don't know if it actually is or not. Is it snowing in Kansas City yet? <laughs> bye bye everybody have a good night